Uh, I'll go ahead and introduce Malcolm Andrews. If you guys don't know him, Malcolm is uh, is such an accomplished Dickensian scholar, uh, bibliographer. Um, uh, he, he teaches in Kent, and uh, I just I've just grown to love him to death since we've been Zooming the last two years. And I don't miss a single talk that he gives. <laughs> and when Malcolm gave this talk for the London Central Group back before the holidays, I just knew I had to bring it to people stateside who didn't have an opportunity to see it. And I do see we still have people from other parts of the world too. But uh, I'm just so thrilled that you're here because you're really, really in for a treat. So Malcolm, I will go ahead and hand it off to you. Okay, um, let me just screen share then. Um, yeah, does that look all right? Looks great. That's coming up okay, right. Um, yeah, looks great. Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Tim, uh, and uh, uh, greetings to all fellow Dickensians. It's it's um, great fun to be able to hop across the pond like this. It's so easy, uh, and indeed around the world. Um, so it's it's really nice to see um, people from uh, hither and yon um, here this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank Tim in the first place for inviting me and for setting it up and for uh, his um, energetic promotion <laughs> of this. Uh, and also thank uh, Courtney um, for um, hosting the, uh, the, uh, the, the session. So uh, <clears throat> Dick is through the... Hello? Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah, everyone, everyone, please mute. Please mute, and if you have any questions for Malcolm, I'm sure he'll be glad to take them at the end of his talk, and you can also post them in the chat, and I'll make sure to monitor them and bring them to Malcolm's attention, okay? But listen, everyone, please mute now. Malcolm should be the only one who is unmuted. All right, okay. Malcolm. Okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to be uh, explaining the, the organization of the talk in, in just a moment, but um, I would like to start this um, examination of, of Dickens and Mirrors and uh, Dickens and Mirrors metaphorical and literal um, with this uh, little photo um, from a blog of a visitor to the museum. Uh, it shows her on the right there, walking into the Charles Dickens Museum in London. She's not looking at the room, but into her phone screen, having presumably just glanced at Dickens's mirror on the dressing table. Her tour of the museum, as with other online Twittering records of visits, mentions that one of the attractions of being there is that there are plenty of opportunities for selfies. And it's reported enthusiastically by her to have several selfie stations. So there she is taking a picture of herself in the mirror in which Dickens once upon a time looked at himself. A selfie with Charles Dickens or with another framed screen somehow retaining some invisible presence of Charles himself. And then, once she's done that, this almost celebrity selfie could be shared with friends. I must admit that I, I do have some sympathy with the visitor here. There is a mysterious thrill about gazing into a mirror that belonged to Dickens. I remember years ago, visiting Bleak House in Broadstairs, which some of you uh, may know who've um, been over to UK and to Kent. Among the objects displayed there was a dressing table mirror in the bedroom traditionally supposed to have been Dickens's. The label beside it said something like this. This is the mirror in which Charles Dickens's face was many times reflected. 
And I remember thinking, I wonder if there is still any ghostly trace in that glass of Dickens's image, somewhere way below that palimpsest of faces that over the last 150 years have appeared in the mirror's frame. The Dickens Museum tourist here and I would both like the old mirror to have had a camera's ability to capture and archive the faces that have appeared there. And indeed, the photographic camera, when it first appeared in Dickens's time, was sometimes seen as a kind of mirror, the mirror with a memory. I'll just quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes, this is just what the daguerreotype has done. It has fixed the most fleeting of our illusions, making a sheet of paper reflect images like a mirror and hold them as a picture. The mirror with a memory. Wonderfully resonant phrase that, the mirror with a memory. Okay, so uh, this is the, uh, the, the route map for, for this talk. I'm going to be starting by uh, giving some brief historical context of the arrival of the mirror in, in 19th century England uh, and, and just, a, just a brief sketch of some of its origins. origins. Um, and then going on to look at the way in which Dickens's illustrators try to cope with mirrors in Dickens's novels. And then thirdly, um, a section on the self in the mirror. And this I'm breaking up into about half a dozen different mini sections, um, mainly psychological and drawing on Dickens and his work, the self in the mirror. And then finally, the way in which Dickens used the mirror uh, for his art in, in very important ways. So we start with the mirror and some history. And I suppose it goes back to uh, something like this image of um, Narcissus in Claude Lorraine's landscape, gazing at his reflection in the pool uh, from the famous uh, Greek myth of Echo and Narcissus. But in their earliest forms, about 9,000 years ago, mirrors were made of highly polished stone or later metal. And it wasn't until the Renaissance that the mirror was made of glass backed with tin mercury amalgam. Before the 19th century, mirrors were very costly and an extensive collection of large mirrors was a conspicuous mark of prosperity as at Versailles' famous Hall of Mirrors built in the late 17th century. Here, as you can see, the mirrors match the size of the large windows opposite and reflect almost floor to ceiling the garden scenes through those windows. At the other end of the mirror scale and more popularly available, there were very small portable mirrors that could perform an interesting visual processing that went beyond mere flat mirror reflection. And this was the, the Claude glass, a device for viewing landscape scenery. The glass was convex shaped, usually with a darkened backing, which cosmetically enhanced the reflected scene by compressing the image and bending marginal trees into arching frames for the main uh, motif, as you can see here in this convex mirror, Claude mirror image. Um, the example here uses Tintin Abbey, uh, one of the famous tourist sites, uh, the ruin of an old monastery as the motif. So the Claude glass is an instrument for editing the natural scene, a mirror that reflects, but also slightly refracts. And from this manipulated image, the sketcher or artist, as you see there on the right, uh, could paint a picturesque landscape. I'll be referring back to this uh, later on in the discussion in thinking about the flat and the shaped mirror, about mirror realism and mirror distortion. In the early 19th century, innovations in glass manufacture made household looking glasses much more affordable. And large mirrors of back silvered glass came within reach of a greater proportion of the population. 
Charles Nossotti there, uh, advertising himself on the left of Oxford Street, was one of the most prominent London shops for mirrors. And we'll be coming back to Nossotti um, near the end of, of the talk. Until this time, probably most of the British population had never seen themselves reflected full length. This changed when the Cheval glass began to be marketed more cheaply. It democratized the full length view of the self. And here are a couple examples. One old one from the Bull Inn in Rochester in what was uh, popularly thought to be, have been Mr. Pickwick's room in Pickwick Papers and, and was indeed occupied by, by Dickens. And then uh, one on the left here. <clears throat> These cheval glasses uh, feature by name in Pickwick Papers and Nicholas Nickleby. In Pickwick Papers, Rochester's Bull Inn um, has one for Mr. Jingle to admire himself in as he puts on Winkle's formal clothes for the ball. And in Nicholas Nickleby, here you see on the right, there's a cheval glass at Madame Mantellini's shop. And this is brought into play as a stage prop at one point. While Kate Nickleby and Miss Nag look on, Two ill-assorted customers in the shop, a very old and lecherous lord and his sprightly young fiancé, chase each other behind the tall mirror for a furtive kiss. When the mirror wardrobe was invented some time later, in other words, incorporating the mirror into this larger piece of uh, furniture, it made the cheval glass more or less redundant for bedrooms. Entertainments based on the cheaper availability of mirror glass, became very popular in the early 19th century. The kaleidoscope was invented early in this period, as was the stereoscope illustrated here, which depended initially, as you can see, on binocular viewing of mirror reflections. And it was, of course, much simplified uh, over, over a period to become a, a, a simple portable item. The craze for mirrors in London went to its most extravagant lengths at the Royal Coburg Theatre, now the Old Vic. Here, the proprietor installed a vast proscenium looking glass curtain made of 63 plates of mirror glass in a giant gold frame weighing five tons. Audiences could sit looking at themselves, one of their favorite spectacles, of course, the performer, it's difficult to see, here he is down here, is the Indian juggler and sword swallower, Ramo Sami. But note that he doesn't really intrude very much into the audience's broader narcissistic pleasure. Several theatres exploited the glamour of mirror glass. The narrator of the old curiosity shop brings Kit Nobbles and his family to Astley's. And the narrator uh, is very enthusiastic, shares the enthusiasm of the Nobles family when they come in, uh, remarking, dear, dear, what a place it looked, that Astley's, with all the paint gilding and looking glass. Mirror glass added glamour to refurbished shops and gin palaces around London and the larger British cities. The Great Exhibition capitalized on the looking glass vogue and boasted two gigantic mirrors positioned at the end of one of the avenues in the Crystal Palace. Punch magazine made fun of the so-called looking glass department of the Great Exhibition and I haven't been able to discover whether there was actually such uh, a department or whether it's a, it's a mischievous uh, suggestion by Punch. Uh, anyway, here from the uh, uh, fictional diary of Miss Haycock is a reference to that exciting uh, department of the Great Exhibition. He met us yesterday again at the exposition. Unluckily, it was in that part of the gallery where the mirrors are exhibited, uh, which is always so crowded with ladies. We could not exchange many words as one's blushes were reflected in every direction and one saw oneself all round and couldn't help thinking everyone saw one. Uh, and I'm not sure if 
that is uh, <laughs> the tone of that is one of regret or or of um, happiness that uh, so many mirrors are affording views of uh, the individual people. Mirrors could, in the big cities, uh, in the early middle 19th century, initiate an orgy of self-gazing. 19th century, whoops, up too far. 19th century Paris too was seized by the mirror craze. Uh, Walter Benjamin, in his Arcades project, cites a writer in 1837 who remarked that Paris was encouraging everyone to become more egoistic. That is what one becomes in Paris, where you can hardly take a step without catching sight of your dearly beloved self. Mirror after mirror, in cafes, restaurants, in shops and stores, in haircutting salons and literary salons, in baths and everywhere, every inch a mirror. As in artfully edited selfies, the mirror reflection can circulate as a substitute for the original. The facsimile can substitute for the authentic. Dickens makes some play with this at the showy veneering dinner in chapter two of Our Mutual Friend. A long descriptive paragraph introduces the grand company at dinner indirectly by attending throughout the mirror's view. Here's a little extract. The great looking glass above the sideboard reflects the new veneering crest, reflects veneering, 40, wavy haired, dark, reflects Twemlow, gray, dry, polite, reflects charming old lady Tippins, and so on. The guests here can be adequately rendered in the mirror's surface because they are themselves, for the most part, surfaces only hence the name veneering. Mirrors in public and private places weren't just for architectural bling in commercial premises or to flatter the vanity of the passers-by. In London, mirrors were instrumental in lightening the city's very sooty gloom. In old photographs of Victorian London streets, you can sometimes see strange flats suspended at 45 degree angles from the front of shops and houses. Here in this street bell yard, you can see quite a number leaning out of the windows. These flats are mirrors leaning out from darkened interiors and trying to claw enough brightness from the sky to reflect into those gloomy rooms. Fizz has included one or two in his illustration of Tom All Alone's in Bleak House. Here's one, and there's one rather dark there. These slanted fixtures are rather like coal chutes for delivering consignments of sunlight straight into the home or shop. Mirrors could also enhance lighting inside the building by the simple expedient of placing your candles close in front of a mirror, the sconce effect. You can see this in a couple of fizzes illustrations to David Copperfield. Well, so much for um, a brief survey of the impact of mirrors on Victorian society and its environment. I'm moving now to the issue of illustrating mirrors for Dickens's illustrators. And picking up on this, this last slide, I want to look at a few examples of the uses to which the illustrators put the mirror. Fizz, characteristically, will use the mirror to comment on the drama depicted in the engraving. So in these two from David Copperfield, on the left, when David Copperfield and Mr. Peggotty finally discover the lost Emily in a grimy attic room, Fizz gives her a cracked mirror, which I hope you can see just here. It belongs with the general dishevelment and upset in the room, but also betokens years of bad luck. The same happens in another illustration in David Copperfield. The sitting room mirror in David's Adelphi apartment is shown in the right hand illustration, and now it bears a crack, signalling the momentous collapse of Aunt Betsy's fortunes. In neither case is this a detail mentioned by Dickens in his text. However, the mirror 
can be a technical quandary for the illustrator. In Pickwick Papers, Fizz depicts a large framed mirror over the mantelpiece in the momentous scene where Mrs. Bardell faints in Mr. Pickwick's arms. It carries no reflection as it ought to. In the earlier plate, the mirror's relative blankness does at least serve to throw Pickwick's anguished face into high relief. I mean, it's a, it's a good dramatic ploy, um, as his head is outlined against the white space. When Fizz re-etched the plate for a later edition, he unaccountably lost this advantage. The central couple here have shrunk and dipped below the mirror frame, and the mirror face itself has been cleared to make an ungainly large blank space. It does seem an odd decision to have made, the mirror's like a great hole in the illustration with no reflective function. Um, and I played around with this in order to digitally add uh, what might be a plausible reflection. But you see, you, you, you see the difference. It sort of clutters up. If Fizz had reproduced accurately and realistically the reflection in the mirror, uh, it would have, um, as it were, crowded the, the illustration too much. It is, of course, a difficult task to judge how much of a reflection to put into a mirror in an illustration in such circumstances. In Dickens's next novel, Oliver Twist, Cruikshank created the ill-fated fireside plate. Here, a large central mantelpiece mirror dominates the scene. It doesn't return any determinate reflected scene as realistically it should, but there is an odd ghostly image in the center. It looks like a reflected framed picture of a group of people. There seem to be two kneeling figures either side of a sitting figure who's possibly holding a child. Maybe it's a Bible scene. Uh, it, it's really impossible to tell. But it is an interesting hesitant gesture towards solving the illustrated mirror problem. I now want to take an instance of a mirror illustration where the illustrator runs into real difficulties. In the final monthly number of Dombey and Son comes the grim chapter Retribution, accompanied by an illustration of the ruined Dombey brooding in his room. And it has the vengeful caption, let him remember it in that room years to come. Mr. Dombey, tortured with remorse, sees his reflected face in the mantelpiece mirror. It leads into an odd refraction of the narrative as the point of view changes. Sitting, thinking in his chair, he saw in the glass from time to time this picture, a spectral, haggard, wasted likeness of himself, brooded and brooded over the empty fireplace. Now it lifted up its head examining the lines and hollows in its face, now hung it down again and brooded afresh. It sat down with its eyes upon the empty fireplace, and as it lost itself in thought, there shone into the room a gleam of light. Um, I've just grabbed these, these uh, sentences here and there from, from the larger narrative. The reflected image here turns the human being into some kind of allegorical creature representing grief and remorse. It objectifies Dombey, drains him of his humanity. He becomes it. He and we then watch this mirrored Dombey creature pacing about and then returning to its chair, now holding something near its breast, a knife maybe, because suicide is in its thoughts. It rises and is about to strike its own breast when, quote, it was arrested by a cry, a wild, loud, piercing, loving, rapturous cry, and he only saw his own reflection in the glass and at his knees, his daughter. Within a single sentence, it returns to he. The haunted creature is rehumanized. But of course, none of this extraordinary scene can be represented by the illustrator. He's done his best, in trying to compress so much into a single static image, 
For example, a single brilliant shaft of light highlights the three heads, Florence the Redeemer, Dombey, and the mirrored Dombey. And then above Dombey, figured in the scenes on the folding screen, Fizz has depicted the family joys that might have been hovering up there as if in Dombey's thought bubble. But Fizz, of course, can't replicate that striking shift in narrative point of view. In Dickens's text, it's as if the film director has cut to a second camera to focus not on the room itself with Dombey brooding in his chair, but on the mirror surface alone. And there, the main narrative becomes mysteriously refracted into a Gothic mode. A creature with a likeness to Dombey, a kind of doppelganger, usurps the scene for several crucial minutes until the shaft of light and Florence break the spell. And none of this surreal mirror sequence can be represented by Fizz. Well, that Dombey scene takes me into my third section, the self in the mirror, where I want to consider some rather more psychological aspects of the mirror gaze in connection with Dickens. Not all in connection with Dickens. Uh, and there are here half a dozen subsections. The first one, the mirror self as confidant. The mirror doubles you. It can offer you a confidential companion you. Bella Wilfer experiences this in Our Mutual Friend. She is a troubled and rather lonely girl with something of a split in her character. And the only person with whom she can be open and honest is her mirror self when they meet in the privacy of her room in front of her looking glass. Here, for example, she berates herself for her complicated feelings about the very kindly boffins. Then pray, said Bella, sternly putting the question to herself in the looking glass as usual. What do you mean by this, you inconsistent little beast? The looking glass, preserving a discreet ministerial silence when thus called upon for explanation, Bella went to bed. And then a little bit later, as usual, there was no answer in the looking glass when she got home and referred these questions to it. At the same time as the mirror can give you intimate one-to-one -one company, yourself, it can also emphasize the solitariness of the self. In her poem, A Royal Princess, Christina Rossetti imagines herself isolated by her high status when she'd rather be a peasant with a baby at her breast. Among the pressures reinforcing her sense of loneliness are the many mirrors in her palace. And here are three lines from the poem. All my walls are lost in mirrors, whereupon I trace self to right hand, self to left hand, self in every place, self same solitary figure, self same seeking face. You can almost imagine she's in that hall of mirrors in Versailles. So two, the mirror self as other. The sight of oneself in a mirror can be both gratifying and disconcerting because the objectified image of oneself may or may not correspond with one's sense of one's own identity. The 56 year old famous actor, William McCready, long preoccupied by growing old, had noted for the first time I saw in the glass today that I really am an old man. The mirror was telling him a truth that he'd been denying himself. Dickens comically plays on this sense of the reflected self as a detached stranger. When in June 1863, after spending several days in bed with an illness, he reports, since Monday last, I have been shaving a man every morning, a stranger to me, with big gaunt eyes and a hollow cheek, whose appearance was rather irksome and oppressive. I'm happy to say he has at last retired from the looking glass and is replaced by the familiar personage whom I have lathered and scraped these 20 years. One's reflected image can be a sobering experience. Sobering being the operative word in David Copperfield's place, but just before that, this um, 
pe these people looking at themselves in the mirror, uh, we might just remember uh, a number of other late 19th century texts fascinated with mirrors and other cells. The picture of Dorian Gray, Alice Through the Looking Glass, and the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Duplicated or transformed cells staring out of the mirror. But back to David Copperfield and uh, this, this sense of the reflected image separating from the original self. Uh, David Copperfield has this drunken party with Steerforth. He calls it his first dissipation. Uh, and when he is very, very drunk, he catches sight of himself in the mirror. And the effect on wine on David has been to alienate himself as someone in the third person. Here's what he describes. Somebody was leaning out of my bedroom window, refreshing his forehead against the cool stone of the parapet and feeling the air upon his face. It was myself. Now somebody was unsteadily contemplating his features in the looking glass. That too was I. I was very pale in the looking glass. My eyes had a vacant appearance and my hair, only my hair and nothing else, looked drunk. Third subsection, the unmirrorable self. In instances such as David's drunken sight of himself, the mirror seems to raise suspicions that each of us has at least one detachable self. The supposed unitariness of the self comes into question. The metaphorically mirrored self is an object of peculiar interest to David throughout the book, because his whole autobiography is a search for identity. Will he or someone else turn out to be the hero of his own story? The very opening of the book. And might that someone else turn out to be actually just another version of himself. David so often seems to be asking, who am I? Who am I going to become? The child Davy or the young man about town David that the older narrating Copperfield is gazing at so intently and describing are both himself and two other people. This sense of the splittable nature of the single self haunts the novel. And symptomatic of this is the chapter title, I am a new boy in more senses than one. Mirror moments, such as David's tipsy dissociation of the cells, can help to destabilize confidence in that unitary individual. And in doing so, it can expose a psychological truth. That is, that each of us is a complex, always developing hybrid composed of all the cells we have been, as well as the one we are now. We therefore have a fluctuating sense of selfhood. It can thus be a bit of a shock to see in the mirror a single, simple, two-dimensional you. Is that it? One might say to oneself, is that all I am? Dickens gave us a version of the unmirrorable hybrid self in the figure of the ghost of Christmas past in Christmas Carol, a floating composite of old age and childhood. A quote, now a thing with one arm, now with one leg, now with 20 legs, now a pair of legs without a head, now a head without a body, of which dissolving parts no outline would be visible in the dense gloom wherein they melted away. And not surprisingly, this is the one ghost in Christmas Carol that couldn't be illustrated in the original version and is very difficult for, for subsequent illustrators to get right. But remember that um, it is, as the illustration on the right suggests, it is Scrooge's lesson to learn to cohabit with his younger selves as he vows to live in the past, the present and the future. So if you're successful in living in the past, the present and the future, how about trying to see that achievement in your mirror reflection? Subsection four, the mirror phase as constituting the self rather than dismantling or splitting the self. The mirror surface simplifies the complex manifold self 
into an individual unitary self. The mirror image has been posited as a crucial factor in human development. The child's realization of selfhood or self-concept is supposed to develop around the age of two. That is when apparently they start recognizing themselves in the mirror, assembling a single coherent identity from the collection of linked limbs, face, trunk, etc. Maybe around the same age, they start using I and me in their speech with a greater awareness of its application to them as individuals. The alleged use of the mirror to help in constituting selfhood is one thing, but the term mirror has also been used metaphorically to identify deeply embedded behavioral patterns in negotiating relations between our own self and others. Thus, in examining brain functions, some neuroscientists and cognitive psychologists have argued that we all have in our mental makeup so-called mirror neurons, mirror neurons. These mirror neurons come into play where brain activity responds to actions performed by another person, particularly one with whom it's important to establish a relationship. The observation can trigger a reflex imitative behavior, mirror behavior, in order to establish a rapport and foster empathy. The immediate involuntary return of a smile, for example. So this mirror neuron mimicry is, as it were, a spontaneous form of impersonation. And that brings us again to Dickens. We know how much he loved impersonation from boyhood onwards. The joy of mirroring in his own behavior, voice and expression, a host of other people. And I'll be coming back to that shortly, that notion of the mirror neuron and Dickens, Dickens as the impersonator. Subsection five, mirror reversal. One particular disconcerting factor is that the image we see of ourselves in the mirror is the wrong way around. It's left, right, reversed. As one of the most famous of literary children, Alice found out when she took herself into the looking glass and out the other side. As happened to Alice, mirror reversal can prove uncanny in its disorienting effect. Lewis Carroll himself reveled in the perplexities of mirror imagery. He wrote letters in mirror writing that then had to be held up to a mirror to be deciphered. He created inversions and reversions for Alice once she'd gone through the looking glass. Alice had to walk backwards to approach the Red Queen. The White Queen lives backwards and can remember things that happened the week after next. One particular left-right reversal haunted Dickens throughout his life. It wasn't really an image in a mirror, but the experience of seeing lettering back to front as if you had gone through a looking glass and then turned round to read the writing on the other side. Here's his memory when he was uh, a wretched child of around 12, having to earn his own living while his family was in prison. One coffee shop I used to frequent was in St Martin's Lane, of which I only recollect that it stood near the church. In the door there was an oval glass plate with coffee room painted on it, addressed towards the street. If I ever find myself in a very different kind of coffee room now, but where there is such an inscription on glass, and read it backward on the wrong side, Moori Fock as I often used to do then in a dismal reverie, a shock goes through my blood. The shock must have been a trigger to dark childhood memories, but also in its verbal deformity, moor e fock becomes a precise emblem of the grotesque reversal of fortune from what Dickens had assumed would be his normal progress in life as a young boy of singular abilities as he described himself at that age. So Maury Fock rears up now and again as a memento of drastically skewed great expectations. Final subsection, Dickens in the mirror. 
Dickens, of course, did like looking at himself in the mirror, and he seems to have done it very often, sometimes with a comic self-consciousness about it, as he writes facetiously to one friend, I had withdrawn from public life, I fondly thought forever, to pass the evening of my days in hydropathical pursuits and the contemplation of virtue, for which latter purpose I had bought a looking glass. Dickens wasn't a particularly vain man, I think, but he was obsessed with tidiness and order and was certainly determined to control the image of himself that he showed to the outside world. And he was fastidious in that respect. It was often remarked how he would pause in front of a mirror as he passed, take out a small comb and briefly comb his hair. His office boy of the London offices of household words remembered this trait vividly and recalled it many, many years later. Dickens, he said, had a very odd habit of combing his hair. He would comb it a hundred times in a day. He seemed never to tire of it. The first thing he did on coming into the office was to comb his hair. I have seen him dictate a sentence or two and then begin combing. When he got through, he dictated another sentence. Katie Dickens, Dickens's daughter, told Gladys story in Dickens and Daughter, that um, fascinating book, that her father liked a tidy head, just as he liked a tidy desk. And quote, this is Katie, if when he went out into the garden, a wind blew his hair about and he caught sight of his disheveled locks in a mirror, he would fly for his hairbrush. This fastidiousness about his hair makes a bit of a puzzle of several formerly posed photographs of Dickens showing his locks looking distinctly dishevelled. Where on earth was his comb on such occasions? Or was this a deliberate designer tousled look? He had a passion for looking glasses, remarked his other daughter, Mamie. So there were looking glasses placed in every possible corner of the house. This is uh, referring to Gads Hill. Tall panel mirrors were installed either side of his desk in his Gads Hill library. Here's one. In fact, mirrors appeared on surfaces all over Gads Hill. And I suspect that their function was just as much to bring light inside as for other purposes. Mamie Dickens recalled, I remember so well on one such occasion, after the walls and doors of the drawing room had been lined with mirrors, my sister's laughing speech to the master, I believe, Papa, that when you become an angel, your wings will be made of looking glass and your crown of scarlet geraniums. Final section then, the mirror and Dickens's art. Dickens gave a speech once to the Royal General Theatrical Fund, in which he compared the novelist with the actor, he of course being both, and invoked Hamlet's famous phrase about the actor's responsibility to hold a mirror up to nature. I quote from the speech, every writer of fiction, though he may not adopt the dramatic form, writes in effect for the stage. The truth and wisdom that are in him must permeate the art of which truth and passion are the life and must be more or less reflected in that great mirror which he holds up to nature. So what kind of mirror did Dickens the novelist hold up to nature? Surely his novels don't give a consistent mirror image of Victorian life, nor were they meant to. He himself countered the prevailing taste for faithful mirror realism. I quote, it does not, sorry, it does not seem to me enough to say of any description that it is the exact truth. The exact truth must be there, but the merit or art in the narrator is the manner of stating the truth. As to which thing in literature, it always seems to me that there is a world to be done. And in these times, when the tendency is to be frightfully literal and catalogue-like, I have an idea 
really founded on the love of what I profess, that the very holding of popular literature through a kind of popular dark age may depend on such fanciful treatment. It's a bit of a distorting mirror that Dickens so often holds up. The truth is there, sometimes with mirror image realism, but more often expressively or expressionistically reshaped, recontoured, certain aspects brightly highlighted and others put into deeper shadow. An example is that sequence of Mr. Dombey in the mirror. Dickens is the creator of the fanciful photograph, to use his terms, rather than the mirror image, the fanciful photograph. He is more the clawed glass with its calculatedly expressive distortions than the flat, faithful looking glass. Now we come to the mirror issue more immediately related to Dickens's creative practice. What happens when you look in the mirror and want to see yourself reflected as someone else? Dickens made a confession on one occasion, which revealed a lifelong inclination. And by assumption here, he means assuming a role as another character. Assumption has charms for me. I hardly know for how many wild reasons. So delightful that I feel a loss of Oh, I can't say what exquisite foolery, when I lose a chance of being someone, in voice, etc., not at all like myself. This was a yearning that Dickens satisfied in his many amateur theatricals and in his public readings, of course. But we also know that he practiced being someone in voice, etc., not at all like himself, when he was composing his novels. This famous description, which I'm going to read, of Dickens and his mirror comes from his daughter, Mamie. It happened probably in 1854 in the Tavistock House study when Mamie had about a serious illness and was allowed in to observe. I was lying on the sofa, endeavoring to keep perfectly quiet while my father wrote busily and rapidly at his desk when he suddenly jumped from his chair, rushed to a mirror which hung near, and in which I could see the reflection of some extraordinary facial contortions which he was making. He returned rapidly to his desk, wrote furiously for a few moments, and then went again to the mirror. The facial pantomime was resumed. Then turning toward, but evidently not seeing me, he began talking rapidly in a low voice. Ceasing this soon, however, he returned once more to his desk, where he remained silently writing until luncheon time. He had thrown himself completely into the character he was creating, and for the time being, he had not only lost sight of his surroundings, but had actually become, in action, as in imagination, the creature of his pen. Dickens indulged in the assumption of many different identities in front of his mirror. Role playing was his stock in trade. It was how he wrote his characters into life. And it was also what he wrote about because the staple of many of his novels is exposing the false selves that have in real life duped the public. His first villain is the master imposter and professional actor Jingle. His last villain is Jasper, who acts a part in order to conceal his deeper self. Both these figures have much of Dickens himself in them, not least because Dickens must have impersonated many of them into being in his mirror. His friend and biographer Forster remarked that Dickens had the power of projecting himself into shapes and suggestions of the fancy, which is one of the marvels of the creative imagination and what he desired to express, he became. What he desired to express, he became. Dickens needed to inhabit these characters in order to master them for representation on the page, and then later on, on the reading platform. I mentioned impersonation earlier in discussing the so-called mirror neurons. I think impersonation always entails some degree of wishing to exercise mastery. 
the impersonator exercises power over the person imitated by demonstrating the ability to appropriate and then reproduce their characteristics. In that respect, Dickens's fascination with impersonation may have much the same impulse as his fascination with his power to mesmerize other people. So when Dickens stood before the mirror in his study, as Mamie recorded, he was watching not himself, but the fictional character into which he had projected himself. Or perhaps that might be slightly modified. Dickens was looking both at the mirror to see back into the real world of himself in his home study and through the mirror into his imaginary world. Dickens used his mirrors as windows into his fictional world, where he warped his normal self into the shapes and expressions and voices of imaginary characters, becoming in action as in imagination the creature of his pen. That is his version of Through the Looking Glass. His mirror gazings both reflect and refract the real world into becoming his imaginary world. I close with a project undertaken by Dickens in the very last years of his life. In May 1868, Dickens wrote a letter to Charles Nosotti, the Oxford Street furniture maker I mentioned earlier, as follows. I shall be glad to take the five glasses, meaning mirrors, framed mirrors, in accordance with your estimate. If you will let me know at Gads Hill, when they are completed, on what day and by what train your workman will come down with them, the cart shall meet him at the station. They will be very easily fixed, the wall being of wood, he's thinking of his chalet, but I wish them to be adjusted by your workmen in order that they may reflect and refract. So these mirrors were for his new chalet study. Sometime later, he wrote to a friend in America describing his new writing room in the chalet's top floor. My room is up among the branches of the trees and the birds and butterflies fly in and out and the green branches shoot in at the open windows and the lights and shadows of the clouds come and go with the rest of the company. Gats Hill's 13 year old gardener at the time, George Woolley, recorded his memories some years after Dickens's death. Opposite the house, he said, was a sort of wood the master called the wilderness. He used to go over there to write in the chalet. I used to hear what sounded like someone making a speech. I wondered what it was at first, and I found out it was Mr. Dickens composing his writing out loud. He was working on Edwin Drood then. In that same letter to his American friend, Dickens highlighted one particular detail of the chalet's furnishings. I have put five mirrors in the chalet where I write, and they reflect and refract in all kinds of ways, the leaves that are quivering at the windows and the great fields of waving corn and the sail dotted river. Given what we know of Dickens's compositional habits, no doubt these multiple mirrors also reflected and refracted Dickens himself as he commuted back and forth across those glass thresholds between his real world and his imaginary worlds. Couldn't it also be said of Dickens's fiction that he has arranged his mirrors of life so that they reflect and refract in all kinds of ways. Thank you. Go ahead and unmute if you guys can. And Fantastic. this is really, really, really good. Cool. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, you can see like Steve has done, he's got his hand raised. Or you can put it in the chat and I'll make sure that I present it to Malcolm. That was a, I just, I just love that talk, Malcolm. I had never, ever 
considered the use of mirrors in the illustrations or the works or mm -hmm. even the history lesson you've given us behind yeah. uh, the advent of the mirror and its use. And, and in 1837, when all of Paris was just, the word you use was egoistic. I love that. It's so <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Steve, did you have a question? Yes, Jasper Malcolm. Oh, hello, Steve. Hi. Hello, Malcolm. <laughs> Just to ask you your questions not so long ago about uh, what was in the upper floor of the chalet and can yes. you get access to it? Is it for this talk? Yeah, yes, yes, it was for this talk. And, but also, I, I've done a talk on uh, um, Dickens and Windows <laughs> as a kind of companion. <laughs> These uh, windows into Dickens's world, and uh, I wanted it for that too. Um, but of course, we can't we can't visit the inside of that chalet room, can we? Alas, no, it's a bit unsafe at the moment. Yeah, yeah. we are working on it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> have Have either one of you been been able to go into the chalet at all in all these years? Yes. Yes, quite regularly. Oh, really? Yes, on the ground floor at the yeah. moment. Okay, on the ground there. floor, but never, never upstairs to his writing room. In the past, yes. Upstairs, yes. all right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Is, it, is it truly that small and compressed as it appeared in the picture? No, it's, it's um, judging. I mean, I get access to the ground floor quite often if I'm taking people around, luckily. And the last... I think the last time I went in there when the Dickens Pickwick Club made an annual visit or made a, one of their visits down and we showed them around with members of the Dickens family, Ian Dickens in particular. And it is quite large inside. Mm -hmm. On the ground floor, if I'm assuming that the upper floor is exactly the same dimensions, yeah. it's quite a large room. Yeah. Yeah, larger than the, the, my photo I think represented. You, you, you need a professional estate agent to go around with a wide angle lens and you <laughs> represent. Well, next time no. I'm in there, I'll actually measure it for you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. I want to say that when I did a walking tour of London, that they took us up into the neighborhood where allegedly the Oliver Twist story took place. And the streets were very narrow. The buildings were tall, and I want to say it was pointed out to me the flap mirrors that mm -hmm. were that were is that do they still exist or am I just imagining that? I want to say our tour guide pointed those out. I've not I've not seen any. You have not seen any. No, no, no. Only in photographs. Yeah, old That's photographs. Better. And I never, I never gave that a thought. People would put their candles next to the mirrors to better illuminate the room. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah duh, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm taking up too much. Glenna, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> I had a comment and a question. Wonderful talk. Um, Thank you. Yeah. It reminded me when you were talking about the history of mirrors. I'm a historian, I have a friend um, I haven't seen her in years, but she told me she's a historian of early modern China. And she told me that there was a practice of when a couple um, were going to be separated, they would uh, get a mirror and they would, um, you know, somehow poetry was inscribed onto it. And they would both look in the mirror and then it would be broken in half. <laughs> so that, you know, that was a way of keeping somehow the image of the beloved. And uh, I just thought that, you know, your talk brought back um, memory of, of having her tell me that. Uh, my question is, I've often thought about how Dickens characters, and I've used the, the phrase in conversations with my fellow Dickensians before, that some of his characters like Jingle or Sari Gamp have almost arias. Yeah. Their, their speeches aren't anything like normal speeches. They're arias. Do you think that this practice of um, 
spend your time in front of a mirror and, you know, just completely inhabiting the imaginary world, yeah. uh, do you think that that enhanced the likelihood that his characters would have this operatic quality? I'm sure, I'm sure you're right. Um, that that um, once he can hear the characters, um, I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary notion, isn't it? That uh, he can actually see these characters once, once he starts impersonating them and then uh, finding the right voice for them. He must have spent an awful long time studying them in front of the mirror, uh, he, he doing, doing the, uh, the characters, so that um, they, they are almost uh, projected or they're built up in such a way as to uh, be able to perform. It's, it's that kind of um, histrionic awareness that, that they, are, they often have, as though they're, they're characters on stage uh, proclaiming or aria or, or, or whatever it is, um, slight, slightly larger than life. But, uh, I mean, Sarah Gamp lapses into soliloquy so often, even though she's pretending to talk to someone else. <laughs> it's a soliloquy, isn't it? <laughs> uh, say, same with uh, Sam Weller. Once he gets going, once he gets his uh, steam up, um, there's no stopping them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, it's interesting when Dickens said um, that, uh, what's it, um, though he may, uh, every writer of fiction, though he may not adopt the dramatic form, writes in effect for the stage. It rather, rather reinforces your point, I think. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ronald has made a comment that the early the girl types were mirrors. Um, the early what? The early the girl types were mirrors, were actually mirrors. Oh, that's interesting. Is that right? Yeah. If ah. Ronald, you could embellish upon that, that would be great. Yeah. Yes, that's here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was not I was not aware of that. Yeah, because it is glass, I think, isn't it? The, the daguerreotype base, is it a kind of glass? Yes. It's quite difficult to focus, you know, to, to actually take a picture of it because, um, because it's on glass. But that's yeah. interesting. Well, Ronald, if you'd like to embellish upon that, yes. we'd love to hear it. He Where might have you? stepped away. He might have stepped away. Um, Oh. The Cheval, the Cheval glass. Now, am I mistaken, or that's still that's still readily available, but it's very, very expensive now. Is yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, they are. They can be quite handsome, handsome objects. But uh, as I say, I think now that uh, tall mirrors are built into wardrobes. Um, uh, no, m many houses don't have room for a separate cheval glass as they take up quite a bit of space. Now, was that cheval glass used in the Great Exposition of uh, that Hall of Mirrors that featured 70 mirrors? I mean, did that, was that all cheval? Uh, you, you, do you mean the great big glass, plate glass ones? Right, yeah. No, they were, they, they were too big. They were too big. Yes, yes. The cheval glass, I think, needs to be something that's on that's hinged, so you can tilt it. You can tilt it back and forth on a pedestal, and uh, and then hinged, so that you can okay. adjust it. I think that's right. I'm not clear why it's called cheval glass. I don't know what it's got to do with horses, but anyway. <laughs> Ronald has added that the, the girl types were like a mirror holding the image. It is the way they make the negative positive. Wow. Uh, That's another whole talk there. Yes, <laughs> yes, it um, is indeed, isn't it? <laughs> you know, yeah. now yeah. that now that I uh, heard you present this the first time, every Every once in a while, I'll sit down like a little boy with my personal library and I'll pull out a book that's illustrated by Fizz. And I look specifically for the mirrors to see <laughs> how they are positioned, if it's cracked, 
and what effect is it having on the character that is relating to the mirror? And wow, you just opened up a whole new world for me. Uh, I, love, <laughs> I love it. Does anyone else have any have any questions? Okay. Well, Gene, Gene Malcolm, thank you so much. Well, very and, nice to see everybody here. Yeah. Maybe we can do this kind of thing again sometime. But, um, that well, would be wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Malcolm. All right. Thank you.